Let's begin by prayer today. Father, we do thank you that we can be here. We thank you for the songs we just got to sing and that we got to worship you like that. Lord, thank you for that, uh, that last song. It's just a blessing and encouragement, especially that it was to me, and I pray to everyone here. Lord, I pray that that would be true of us. I pray that the word tonight would, uh, would help that to be true of us, that you're, that you're everything, that knowing you means everything to us, and it changes everything about us. Father, we pray for the sermon, for your word tonight. Lord, I ask two things of you. I pray that you would give me precision to teach your word accurately, rightly, clearly, and Lord, I pray that you give me power to teach your word boldly, passionately, and confidently. Because I, I have neither of those two things in myself, but, but you have the power to give me everything I need to be unashamed in, in your sight uh, as I preach your word. And so I look to you for that. And I trust that you will supply. And Lord, I pray that you would work in, in the hearts of everyone sitting here uh, in, in, uh, in the way that only you can. So that the result is that you're glorified, you're lifted up, the truth is told about your son, we're encouraged as we behold him, we leave this place equipped and excited to go and, and make disciples outside the walls of this building. Lord, I just thank you once again for the text we're about to look at and for the effect it's had on my life and may it have that same effect on everyone here. pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, a few days ago, my wife and I were talking, and uh, we were noticing the fact that a lot of our brothers and sisters in Christ, some of the guys that we counsel, some people who don't even go to this church, a lot of them were struggling with just feelings of being down in different ways, including ourselves, um, just darkness, and uh, in some cases, depression, in other cases, just people who are normally joyful, just struggling to find that same joy. And so as I thought about what I wanted to teach tonight, I, I was hoping the Lord would lead me to something that spoke to that, um, a passage that, that spoke to what to do or what mindset to put on whenever we are not feeling the joy that we should feel in Christ. I think perhaps that's why the Lord led a pastor to teach on gratitude this weekend. I think that was a blessing to all of us. And hopefully this is another encouragement. So uh, in that, he did take me to Psalm 130, which you can go ahead and start turning there. It used to be one of my favorite psalms, but then I kind of forgot about it for a while. And so I'm so grateful to the Lord bringing it back to my attention and getting to really dig deep into it for the first time this week. I, I love it more than ever now. Hopefully I'll never forget it again. So we're just going to work our way through piece by piece. It's a really simple psalm. The application is so easy to make. Honestly, my prayer is that I just don't get in the way of it. And so let's begin at the beginning of verse 1. Just with those first four words, they give us the setting of the psalm, but it's not so much a historical, uh, cultural setting, because these psalms are, are very difficult to place in that arena, but rather it's uh, the setting in the heart of the person writing it. The heart setting. You could say the the mental, spiritual, emotional place that this author is writing this psalm out of. And so there it is. You can see it out of the depths. This psalm is coming from a man who's in the depths. And this word, it's used five times, and every other time it's used in combination with the word waters or the word sea. So that's probably the kind of thing he has in mind. The depths of the waters... The depths of the ocean, the depths of the sea. David uses it that way in Psalm 69. He says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire from where there's no foothold. I have come into deep waters. And that's that same word that we see in our text, deep waters. The flood sweeps over me. And he uses it again later in the verse. He says, deliver me from the sinking in the mire. Let me... Be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up. And so that's probably what this author is envisioning. Deep as in deep, deep in a storm on the ocean. Struggling to stay afloat. Feeling like you're drowning. Suffocating, can't get out. Being overwhelmed by the waves. 
Or it's possible he, he could have in mind some kind of pit. Later in that same chapter, Psalm 69, David says, Don't let the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. That could be also be something he's envisioning when he says, Out of the depths. The idea of being at the bottom of a pit that's closing over your head. The light is, is failing and you can't seem to climb out. There doesn't seem to be any hope. Hopeless, helpless. That's the situation. That's the heart setting for this psalm. And so I would ask you, are you in a dark place? Like this author was. Are you in a dark place? It could be something brought on by circumstances. You're sick, possibly. Uh, financially. Uh, relationship suffering. Or it could be something where you don't know where it's coming from. But you just feel darkness. You don't feel the presence of God, maybe. And if that's, it's, that's not you, I hope it's not, but it, if it's not, do you know anyone who could be in a dark place? I want to encourage us tonight because I know not everyone here is struggling with depression. Not everyone here is in a dark place. Let's hear God's word tonight, not just as receivers, but as reproducers. Let's listen in such a way that we don't have the thought process of, well, if it doesn't apply to me, why listen? No, let's have the thought of, let me listen to teach. Listen in such a way that I can now take this chapter and I can go apply it to those who are struggling. That should be our attitude every time we hear the word of God taught. We don't just listen for us, do we? We listen to reproduce. And so I would encourage you to do that. And the first thing that this man does out of this dark place, I believe, is because we don't know the author. It says the Psalm of Asaph, but whether he's writing it from his own point of view or someone else's, we don't know. And so the first thing that he does, I would say, is the appropriate response. Look there. He says, out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. I cry to you. God wants his people to turn to him in their time of darkness. In fact, I'm convinced that part of the reason, if not one of the biggest reason, he even allows us to go through these times of darkness is to get us to cry out to him. Listen to what Hosea chapter 5 verse 14 says. God speaking says, For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place, as in withdrawing from them, until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face, and in their distress earnestly seek me. And this is what he wants them to say. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down. And he will bind us up. You see, our shepherd doesn't just lead us in the green pastures. And besides the still waters, does he? Sometimes he'll take us to the valley of the shadow of death. And when we're in the valley, it's not that it's not frightening. It's not that it's not sad. It's not that it's not difficult. We don't despair because, what did David say? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. You're with me. Even when it's at its darkest, you're with me. And so God will allow us to go through the valley to teach us to cry out to him. My father told me growing up, there are three main ways that we grow closer to God. Through studying the word of God, through prayer, and through trials. I, th I think that's so wise. I think that's so right. <laughs> Whether your depths were brought on maybe by something you did, your own sin, or whether it was by something completely outside of your control, you can know that not only is God with you, he's at work for your good. And he's teaching you to trust in him in the worst of times. And in the darkest of times. You must believe that God is using it to draw you closer to him. That you would cry out to him. 
Spurgeon words it this way in his commentary on this verse. He says, deep places beget deep devotion. Depths of earnestness are stirred by depths of tribulation. Isn't that awesome? Depths of earnestness are stirred by depths of tribulation. And we see that to be true in our own lives. When we're doing well, when everything seems to be going well, is so often when our prayers become routine. And when God takes the stability from our lives, now we recognize our need for him more than ever. And we cry out in an earnestness that maybe wasn't there when the darkness wasn't there. And so the first and more, most important thing you can do in the depths is to cry out to God. Now, I want to be clear here. That is not to say that there are not other appropriate steps to be taken in the practical realm. Uh, for example, if you were to come to me sick with cancer, I would say cry out to God. But then I would say, and go see a doctor. And so if you're struggling with depression, if you're struggling with uh, this weight if you feel like you're drowning, if you feel like you're in a dark place, first and foremost, you cry out to God, but don't neglect the means that God has provided to see you out of that place. Because he works through means, doesn't he? And so I would say, if you need to see a doctor, if you need to go speak to a wise and mature saint and get counsel, do take those steps. Take, the things, take advantage of the means that God has provided to work through for your deliverance. But here is the point, and here's what I want to make sure you understand. The question is, where do you turn to first, and where is your hope? Because it's very easy to start hoping in those things. Instead of hoping in the one who provides and works through those things. And so have the acknowledgement and, and, and pursue the avenues that he has given you to seek help with the constant awareness and trust that ultimately he is your deliverer. And that he's the one who will have to see you through. And so what do you do when you've cried out to God, when you are striving to put your hope in him, and there seems to be no response. I believe that's what the author was facing in this situation. Look at the next verse. He says, O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Why would he pray for God to hear his prayers? It's kind of a funny thing to pray for at first glance. I would submit to you it's probably because it seemed like God wasn't hearing his prayers. It seemed like there was no response. He wasn't sure God perhaps was listening. Perhaps he had been in the midst of this deep place, this dark place for a long time. Perhaps he had prayed a, a, about it over and over. Perhaps he had cried out on multiple occasions. Uh, perhaps he was wondering if God was even listening. And so he says, Please hear me. I'm crying out for mercy. Won't you listen? Won't you pay attention? Have you ever felt like God was not hearing your prayers? I know I have. I think most of us have felt that way. Maybe you're feeling that way right now. What should you do when you feel that way? Well, there's multiple steps to take that we're going to see that this author takes. But the first one, I would say, is be honest with God. Communicate with him. You realize, right, that he already knows the way you're feeling. Right? To acknowledge the way you're feeling before him is not going to be revelation for him. Okay? He understands what's in your heart. And so express it to him. It's a relationship, and there needs to be that communication. Uh, I think, uh, well, I'll just give you an example. I was... I was feeling very much this way a few weeks ago, and there was a situation that I had been praying for for months, hadn't gotten an answer yet, but then I said, God, I'm going to devote myself to praying for this for a week. I mean, I'm going to be committed, not just during my regular prayer time, I'm going to go out of my way to ask you to help in this situation, and for a week, I did that, and at the end of that week, it was the worst it had ever been. I said, God, am I supposed to suffer more because I've prayed more? I was confused. I didn't understand. I fell on my face. I said, do you even care? 
that we're suffering here? Do you care that we're suffering? Do, are you listening? Can't you hear me? You tell me to cry to you when I'm in a dark place, and here I am crying, and nothing is changing. What is going on? I think this is how the, the psalmist is feeling. Spurgeon, if you're going to notice, I love his commentary on this psalm. Uh, because I'm going to quote it on every verse. But he said this, When we have already prayed over our troubles, it is well to pray over our prayers. If we can find no more words, let us entreat the Lord to hear those petitions which we have already presented. I thought that was awesome. And so this is a, an important step. But it's not the last step. Praise God. Can you think of any other reason why the author might feel like his prayers are not being heard? I told you it could be that it, some time had passed, right? You usually don't say, Lord, I cry out to you, and then immediately, hey, did you hear me? Right? So I think there's probably some time that's passed between verse 1 and 2, but I think that there's more than that. I think verse 3 gives us a hint of that. Look at it. It says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities... Oh, Lord. You notice he's saying that a lot, don't you? Oh, Lord, who could stand? And so the placement of this verse here, right after saying, I've cried to you, hear my voice. If you should mark iniquities, who should stand? This tells us that these depths of, that he was experiencing, whatever they were, were somehow tied to sin. Somehow tied to iniquity. Now whether it was that he couldn't get out of a particular iniquity, or perhaps that he was feeling guilt over that iniquity, or perhaps he was suffering the consequences or the disciplining hand of God for that iniquity. We don't know. But Spurgeon says, puts it this way, this verse shows that the psalmist was under a sense of sin and felt it imperative upon him not only to cry to God as a suppliant, right? not only to ask of God for deliverance, but also to confess as a sinner. And so somehow or another, he feels a need to confess as a sinner in the midst of this depth, in the midst of this trial, this darkness. I, he is acknowledging the fact that that he is completely undeserving of the mercy that he is requesting. Isn't that great? He's saying, I'm in the depths. I've cried out to you to rescue me. I'm begging you to hear my cries. But I recognize this, that I deserve everything that I'm suffering and more. And you owe me nothing. I can't stand before you in my own righteousness and expect you to do anything for me. If you should mark iniquities, if I were to be judged on my life record of sins and righteousness, I would have no bearing or weight before you or right to receive anything good from your hand. And this is an essential step to take. Even though it is okay to be honest with God about our feelings, we must strive to inform our feelings and to inform our thoughts with the truth that we are sinful wretches. And that if we were to stand before God in our own righteousness, we would deserve far worse than whatever trial we are in. We deserve the flames. Essentially, he's saying, I am not appealing to you, God, on the basis of my righteousness because I recognize that I have none. But that begs the question then, on what basis is he appealing for deliverance? And verse 4 answers that. He says, but with you there is forgiveness. Just as it is right for us to inform our thoughts and our emotions with the truth about ourselves that we are sinners and unworthy of anything good from the hand of God, it is equally right and appropriate and necessary to inform our thoughts and our emotions 
with the truth about God, that he is forgiving, a merciful God. Maybe you feel like God does not hear you because of how awful you have been. Let me make this clear. This is a lie if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is a lie. And it comes from a source that is out for your harm. Because if the enemy can get you to believe that, you will never get out of that pit. You will never get out of that ocean as long as you think that your God has turned his back on you and that there is no forgiveness for you anymore. Don't get me wrong. If we were coming to God on the basis of our righteousness, it would be true. He would not hear us. This is why he doesn't believe, he doesn't hear an unbeliever who comes to him not in the name of Jesus, but in his own way, on his own righteousness, and asks things of God. We know that if the Lord should count iniquities, no one could stand. Or was there one who could stand? Was there one who could stand before God on the basis of his life? There was, wasn't there? There was one. There was a man who lived a life that merited the favor of God. And so when we go to God, we don't go to him in our name or in our righteousness. We go to him in the name of the only one who can stand before him, make his requests known, and expect to be heard and answered. And that one is Jesus Christ. We go in his name. Isn't that what we say when we pray? Do you mean it? You're coming before God in the name of Jesus Christ. Hence, Ephesians 3.12, in Christ we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Turn with me to Hebrews, please, chapter 10. Another great New Testament example of this truth. Look at verse 10. It says, and by that will, that will is God's will. If you look in the verses above, it's talking about God's will. And so, and by God's will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How? Once for all. Now, the, keep in mind here, he's not using sanctified in the way that is typically used, especially in Pauline literature. When he says we have been sanctified once for all, he's not talking about that daily building up of the righteousness of Christ in our life that is, a, that is a product of the Holy Spirit. Rather, he's talking about the fact that we have been set apart, made holy before God once for all, the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ and he became our advocate. That's what he's talking about. He'll use sanctification in the other way later, but for now he's saying we have been once for all through the offering of the body, Jesus Christ. Keep going. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Do you see the emphasis on finality in those verses? Right? For all time, for all time, a single sacrifice, a single offering has been sanctified, has been perfected. He's driving at a point here. You have been forgiven of all of your sins in Jesus Christ. They're all paid for down to the last one, paid in full. There is no punishment left to be paid for your sins. End of story, period. That's the gospel. 
Keep going. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is a covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Don't cheapen the grace of God by punishing yourself for sins as if Christ's punishment wasn't enough. Do you understand? That's what you're saying. When you hang on to your sin, when you hang on to your guilt and your shame, don't get me wrong. There is a place. Well, we'll get to that later, actually, in the next verse, so I won't get ahead of myself. We'll get to that later, but for now, we need to come to God with an awareness Yes, of our worthlessness in and of ourselves, but just as importantly, an awareness of our forgiveness in Christ, of who we are in Christ, washed clean. Do you think that when you sin, God's learning about it for the first time? Or do you think he not only knew about it, but he already, Jesus already suffered the wrath of God for it? Right? And so recognize with you there is forgiveness. He has already paid for that sin. That guilt is not yours to pay. That punishment is not yours to pay anymore. Now we'll get to the the next part of the verse which is glorious and so important. It says that you may be feared. And it's so important because I fear that some people think that by holding on to their sin, what I was just telling you not to do, by holding on to their shame, that they're somehow pleasing God and promoting piety in themselves, right? As if that is going to drive them to do better in the future when the reality is that nothing produces holiness in God's people more than a right understanding of forgiveness, Spurgeon said, none fear the Lord like those who have experienced his forgiving love. Gratitude for pardon produces far more fear and reverence of God than all the dread which is inspired by punishment. It is grace which leads the way to a holy regard of God and a fear of grieving him. God does not discipline his children to lead them to remorse. He disciplines them to lead them to repentance. And that is a key difference. Judas had remorse. Where did that lead him? 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10, Paul is addressing this very thing in the Corinthians, or he addresses it indirectly here when he says, for I see that the letter, the other letter he had sent, it grieved you though only for a little while. Grief over our sins is a byproduct of the Holy Spirit in our conscience in the act of leading us to something. It is never an end in itself. It is never something to be prolonged once its appointed end has been fulfilled. It is for a season. It is only for a little while. He says, as it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. You see? Grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Wallowing in guilt only leads to more sin. Embracing grace leads to reverence and love for God because we realize that he knew about every single sin that we were going to commit before he went to the cross and he did it anyway. And so you see, as we continue on and we stumble and and don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Should we continue in grace that sin? Uh, should we continue in sin that grace should abound? Of course not. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying 
is that as we do stumble in our striving, we just realize how much he truly paid for on that day that we had no idea. And we realize he loved us more than we ever thought that we were loved. And his grace is greater than we ever knew that it was. And the result is that we are in reverence and awe of this God who would love us, worthless people. And we love him more for what we realize he's done for us. And that love drives us to want to please him and not want to grieve him. And it leads us to holiness. So you see, it is embracing forgiveness that produces the character of Christ in our life. With you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. It leads us to, to reverence him, all, have all of him, fear him and love him. And so if you're in the depths, if you've cried out to God, if you've pleaded with him to hear your cries, you have a right understanding of how your sinfulness meets with God's covering forgiveness so that you know that you don't deserve it. But he loves and hears you anyway. What do you do now? What did the psalmist do next? Let's take a look. Verse five, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. Next we wait. But waiting on the Lord is never a motionless activity. To wait on the Lord means to strive to honor him in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the pit sometimes, even while you long for him to come and lift you out of it. In essence, it is to trust his goodness and his timing and resolve yourself to serve him there in the depths. Lord, I want you to rescue me. And I trust that you will in your timing. But until then, I will follow you. And that's hard. That's very hard. In fact, I would say it's impossible if you're not hoping in his word. And look at the end of that verse. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word, I hope. Do you know what it is in the midst of the storm, the darkness, to cling to the promises of God, to cling to the word of God and to trust it even when it seems impossible? Or are you letting yourself believe the lies of the enemy there in that dark place? Because I promise you, he's feeding them to you as fast as he can. Some of the examples of Verses that I, I literally cling to in times of darkness. I would ask you, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no trial has overtaken you beyond that which is common to man and God is faithful. And with it, he will provide a way of escape so that you may stand up under it. Are you believing the lie? I can't do this. I can't do this. You're hearing that in the back of your mind when you're in the depths, I promise you. Are you believing that or are you believing I am faithful? I will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. I will not let you be tested beyond what you are able to bear. Do you realize, I know this sounds harsh, but do you realize when you say I can't as a child of God, you're calling God a liar because he said you can. Do you realize or do you ever uh, believe the lie that God hasn't given me enough of what I need to get through this. If God would give me more patience, more joy, more humility, more wisdom, whatever it may be, I would be able to get through this. Do you believe the promise, 1 Peter 1, 3? His divine power has granted to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Which are you gonna believe? Your human thoughts which are so often demonic thoughts. Or are you going to believe the word of God? 
Are you going to call him a liar or are you going to call Satan a liar? That's his native tongue after all. Some other ones, this one I can't tell you how many times has picked me, has picked me up. Psalm 4.3, the Lord has set apart the righteous man for himself. The Lord hears when I cry to him. Man, I love that. I can't tell you, I've had people ask me. I've had, been in situations that looked hopeless. I said, don't give up hope. Keep praying. Trust God. They say, how can you? I say, it's going to turn out. God's going to work it out. How can you know that? I'll come right here because the Lord hears when I call to him. And that's not because of anything in myself. When it says the righteous, the Lord set apart the righteous for himself, it's because I've been made righteous that I can know that the Lord hears when I call to him. And I cling to that verse. Even when I feel like he's a million miles away, when I feel like he's not listening, I cling to that promise. He hears even when it doesn't feel like it. You've got to believe it. How about this one? God's abandoned me. I feel like he's left me. I feel like he's that million miles away. Hebrews 13, 5. He has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Do you believe it? Or do you believe the lie? He's forsaken me. No, he hasn't. But what matters is what do you believe? Because that's going to affect your decisions you make and the life you live. And then finally, Romans 8. Romans 8, 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Until you believe that, you're going to be in the pit. Because good luck going to the bottom of the ocean where Jesus has buried your sin, strapping it back to your back and swimming out. That's not going to happen. You're going to be stuck right there and there at the bottom of the ocean. Don't carry that burden. He's carried it for you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're not climbing out of that pit with a 100-pound weight on your back of your shame and your guilt. It's not going to happen. Let it go. The Lord wants you to let it go. And then, of course, Romans 8, 28. We know that he works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. That's a hard one to believe sometimes. Do you believe it? When it's at its darkest, do you believe it? All things for good. Look how he concludes the section about himself in verse 6. In verses 7 and 8, he turns to Israel, but he concludes his own journey here in verse 6. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. You see, waiting is not just emotionless or is not a motionless activity. It is also not an emotionless activity, is it? Waiting doesn't mean dispassion. Waiting doesn't mean stoicism. He uses it, it, it involves deep longing. He uses an analogy here, right? The watchman for the morning. It's a pretty simple one to get, right? You've got these watchmen probably on the walls of Jerusalem, maybe he's envisioning, and it's, it's nighttime, it's cold, you cannot wait for the sun to break over the horizon. I mean, you can try to put yourself in their shoes and just imagine you're shivering on this wall. I mean, especially in peacetime, right? You're up there during Solomon's reign. You're like, what is the point? You know what I'm saying? There's no one coming, all right? And so, but, but that would be awful. And you can't wait for that sun to come up. But, but get this. It's hard for us to actually put ourselves in their shoes because how many of you have had to keep watch at night in the outdoors for sun to come up? Probably not many of you. But I bet there's a few hunters in here, right? Not our pastor. He made that very clear. No, but I bet there's a few hunters in here. And you know exactly what I'm talking about because if you're not miserable when you're deer hunting, you're not doing it right. You better be freezing to the, you better go, go out on the coldest day of the year. Some of you guys are like, that's not true, but you're the guys who probably go seven or eight times a year and don't get anything, all right? Trust me, if you, you, you got to pick the coldest day of the year. It's got to be drizzling to the point where it, it can't be raining so hard that you have the excuse to go inside, 
right? The deer won't be out. No, uh, but, but it still has to be enough to completely soak through your gloves and your boots. So your toes are numb. Your fingertips are numb. You know, I like to get out there real early. So I, you know, don't disturb anything. I'm up there an hour and a half before daybreak. It's 40 degrees. And man, I am praying for the sun. I'm longing for the sun. And when it starts to come up, you start to feel you wiggle your toes and wiggle your fingers. Yes, right? So you can understand. My hunters can understand this analogy. It's a, it's a longing. It's a real desire. It involves emotion. And so don't, don't think I'm saying you wait there. I mean, it, you know what? I think the best analogy is this is the same way we're told to, talk, to think about the second coming, isn't it? Right? We want it, shouldn't we? And yet it's not here yet, right? And so we're crying out for it. We continue to cry out for it. God's timing isn't yet. We trust that it will happen, don't we? In the meantime, we wait. We don't wait without motion. We're actively obeying the Lord, right? We don't wait without emotion. We're yearning for him to come. And so you see it's very similar, right? Waiting on a temporary deliverance, the way we wait on God in a temporary deliverance is very similar to the way we wait on him for that ultimate deliverance. And now to to conclude, he takes these principles that he's applied in his own grief, depression, darkness, and he applies them to Israel's situation. He says, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And so I'm just going to end tonight by doing the same thing that he did. I'm going to say, oh, church, hope in the Lord. Oh, church, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. This is hesed. This is God's covenant-keeping, faithful love for his people. You know God has made a covenant with you? The new covenant, inaugurated by the blood and body of Christ. He has promised, he has sworn, and he will not change his mind. You are his, he has bought you, and he will not let you go. With the Lord there is steadfast love. You can't out his grace. Not that we would ever want to, but you can't do it. And with him there is abundant redemption. He says here, he says, he will redeem Israel from all of his iniquities. But isn't it beautiful, standing on this side of the cross, to have a different perspective. Church, he has redeemed you from all of your iniquities. He has redeemed you from all of your iniquities. Praise God. Romans 8.32, I close by reading this verse. I'll probably read it at the end of half of my sermons. That's okay. It applies to most of them. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Man, he loves you. He loves you so much. You, can, you can't understand it, how much he loves you. And he knows you're in the depth. He knows where you are. He hears you. He's as near to you as your own heart. He may feel a million miles away. Are you going to trust your feelings? Or are you going to trust his word? He is near to you if you know Jesus Christ. And he has a plan. And he is working it out for your good. No matter how impossible that seems, you must believe it. And you must cry out to him, trust in him, and wait on the Lord. Hope in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, this psalm is amazing. And I give you great thanks for bringing it to us tonight. Lord, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that you want us to turn to you and that you're always there for us. We thank you for grace and forgiveness, Lord. We thank you for revealing the fact that we can't stand before you in ourselves, that we deserve nothing, but that Jesus deserved it all and he stands in our place. Lord, you are good to us and we just pray that you would help us to go throughout our week in a constant recognition of your goodness and love and mercy. For those who are indeed feeling down, 
whether it's been a long time or it's something that's happened this week, whether it's due to circumstances, whether it's due to sin, Lord, help them to think rightly about you, who you are, what you've done, and to hope in you. And for those of us who are on the mountaintop, for those of us who are in a joyful place, Lord, we thank you for that. That's your grace. Lord, help us not to be so selfish as not to notice those around us who are struggling. Give us empathetic hearts. Give us the heart of Christ who had compassion on the crowd. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand together.